So hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Kluka Weekly. Joining us this week is our friend, friend of the open source community and the conference community, Alan Quayle. Thank you for joining us today, Alan. Thank you so much, Luca. I'm happy to finally be here after so many years of invitations. It was a little embarrassing on my behalf. Oh, it's been a while, but we've, we've met each other so many times that it was, I mean, yeah. we, we had to do it. It was just, uh, it was just time to do it. Well, uh, I mean, for the four people who probably haven't heard of you <laughs> yet are in the audience, would you like to start with a quick intro about yourself? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So the name, Alan Quayle. I've been in uh, telecoms communications for three odd decades, hence all the white hair. It has a bad long-term effect. So, Luca, you can see you've still got a proper head of hair. It hasn't turned white yet. It will very soon. But uh, uh, yeah, oh, you can hardly notice it. You know, it's like this <laughs> where the, the only bits of color, you know. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I um, started my career off actually on the telecom side, uh, working for a telco, BT, in the UK uh, at their research labs over in uh, Martlesham Heath, uh, uh, and worked on a whole range of things, uh, you know, from devices of building up to electronic integrated circuits, uh, working on video compression to um, stuff that actually, you know, I have in my home. So, for example, uh, fiber to the home, I worked on uh, those standards and that finally about 10 years ago deployed to my home. So, uh, you know, I have fiber and uh, I've never needed to uh, change my broadband provider since. I then went off and uh, got some experience on the vendor side. So I worked for Lucent, that became Alcatel Lucent, and there I was doing a lot of work on 3G. So uh, that was trying to persuade telcos that this video telephony stuff mm -hmm. would take off on mobile. I won't go any further than just say we tried. Um, I then yeah. founded a company, uh, and uh, that was called Teltia, and that was in the mobile um, presence space. So we exposed an API, two developers all the way back in sort of uh, 2001, 2002. So you knew whether your mobile phone was on or not. Now, these are back in the days mm. when people would turn off their mobile phone. And uh, even back then, people would get voice messages, but you know, it's a pain. You've got to like yeah. call it. So what we do is we just log all the numbers that called you while your mobile was off, not connected to the network. And you'd be surprised how often your mobile wasn't connected to the network in those days. And then once you reconnected, we'd send a message with all the people that called you while your mobile phone was off. So that got us to basically deployments. We ended up being sold to Cisco. After that, I thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll take a, uh, a break. This telecom API stuff, this programmable communications seems to have a, you know, a, a, a lot more opportunity than just presence. And I was working independently, helping a whole range of different companies in uh, telecom APIs. I ended up founding uh, a couple of uh, events, TAD Summit, and that mm -hmm. is Telecom Application Developer Summit. And you know, it's the only event that's out there that clearly states no BS, because there's a lot of BS out there. So uh, we've really sort of, uh, since 2013, been running events all around the world, helping people understand the reality, the challenges, the opportunities around programmable communications, which are still vibrant today, as we see with Signal Wire's, uh, you know, uh, AI gateway as a great example of all the innovations that are uh, taking place. The year after, in 2014, we founded a, an event called TADHack. So. Mm -hmm. Telecom Application Developer Hackathon. And we've been running events all around the world, uh, helping lots of people. You, you know, you could be a telecoms engineer. You could be just students, uh, you know, with an interest in programming. Could be a web or enterprise developer. And helping them all understand how to use programmable communications. So not just voice messaging, but all the other cool stuff that you can do around that and that's still running today we had an event just before enterprise connect in march and uh, signal wire were one of the uh, sponsors so uh, you were able to get your uh, uh, gateway out there get developers on there and it's really great to see just the hacks that were created the uh, excitement around 
the uh, you know the platform you've created and how easy it is for uh, developers to use. And we have an event coming up in October on the mm -hmm. 19th and 20th. That's Tad Hack Global. That has locations all around the world. So uh, we've just launched the site. Um, it, it, it's 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 a beta. You know, it, uh, yeah, there's a lot of work to do, but. Over the summer, we'll get that all up and running and uh, hopefully get a great uh, group of people together to hack and solve problems around uh, you know, issues that matter that, to them. Because one of the things that's very different with uh, TATAC, I mean, you've got, of course, the big brand events, the Microsoft, mm -hmm. the uh, Amazon, they're big. You should be grateful for hacking on our platform. Well, we know there's a lot of competition out there, so we've always had cash prizes. So that you know, people can get cash recognition. That you know, because you spend a weekend away from the family, and it's nice that hey, you know, you can come back with some cash rather than say a uh, Millennium mm -hmm. Falcon drone, uh, which doesn't really do much for your partner. Uh, while if you've got some cash, you can have a family meal. You can you know maybe even you know for a holiday because some of the prices have been quite big. So that's part of what we try to do, and we continue to bang the drum on the importance of developers. And you know, being open and honest in the industry, because you know, people are trying to build businesses, they're trying to solve problems, and you know, telecoms is still a bit of a mess. I mean, just look at mm, all yeah. the spam SMS, the robocalling, and all the scams that are taking place over that. I, you know, people's lives are being severely affected. So again, what we do is we show where the problems are coming from and what the industry needs to do. So I always I sort of refer to us as you know the conscience of our industry. Mm. It's very very nice, very nicely put it. Yeah, especially the open source components and yes. the developer oriented APIs really truly are the conscience of this uh, this industry when it comes to keeping standards honest, uh, <laughs> keeping everybody on standards because otherwise yes. everybody comes up with uh, well the whole programmable with... communications industry you know that started twenty odd years ago wouldn't exist if it wasn't for open source simple as that yeah there was no, and the known open source players realized the importance of it after the fact like after a while they realized hey i can do some cool stuff why can't my platform do it and to a degree many of those platforms still can't like mm -hmm. if you need something specific you still have to uh... well that, that leads into a good question for you you've been in the industry for a long time you've been an observer and you've been a researcher and you know much more about the industry than probably most other people that we've got on the show. Uh, what do you think? Uh, so, what, what do you say happened in the last 10 years? Well, what are the main changes you've seen happen? And what's next? Mm, yeah, great questions. So, the big change is the democratization of telecoms. Mm. Because once upon a time, you had to get your um, soft switch or switch from a big telecoms related vendor. It was expensive, mm -hmm. it was inflexible, uh, it was a, a big company game. Um, and then, you know, it really was as the likes of, you know, Twilio, Nexmo, all these uh, programmable communication companies exposed very simple APIs, not standard APIs that the telco industry keeps getting overly excited about, just easy to use. And with lots of sample code, lots of just, you know, easy to understand documentation. You do a search, I need to send an SMS from this app and you, you know, and it needs to be in Python and you could download it change basically your, your keys and you know, really cut and paste programming. And it was adoption of, now this is ancient history now, but you know, it was just telecoms adopting web two principles. That's all it was. And you know, many players uh, in the programmable com space did that and achieved immense success. I mean, you know, I'll just point out that during the pandemic, Twilio had the same uh, enterprise value as some of the big telcos. I mean, that's amazing when you consider its thin role within you know, uh, the uh, industry. So that's been written large now. It's maturing. Uh, so we're now in a very interesting phase because uh, you know, the carriers, you know, the telcos are looking on and going, well, wait a minute. Twilio got that valuation? Well, I want some of that valuation. So 
we've seen the carriers raising prices mm -hmm. for SMS. Uh, you know, once upon a time, it was like a fractions of a penny. Now it's half a penny to a penny. Um, and we've seen, you know, globally, carriers looking, okay, so there's this company here, and they're offering APIs, and they're reselling our messaging APIs. And who's their biggest client? Oh, it's Facebook. Oh, it's Google. Well, I'll just go and straight, sell straight, straight to them. And basically, you know, I'll just offer them a uh, slight discount compared to what they're paying to that provider. So they've been able to gobble up some of the big accounts. Uh, so we've seen that shift over the last few years, particularly through the uh, pandemic, because that really did drive home the importance of using PSDN services so people can, you know, order food or get notifications when they arrive at a particular location. All these processes you know, really got automated through PSTN services. So Pelcos have sort of grabbed a share of that. And now, you know, again, Pelcos have their strengths, don't get me wrong, uh, but they're looking at, well, we can now, you know, take more of these APIs and uh, we'll standardize them because standardization is the best thing because that's what makes telecom su you know, successful. And it, it is, don't get me wrong, the air interface, for a mobile network has to be standardized, full stop. Otherwise, you're not gonna get all those mobile phones working. You can't have fragmentation there. But it's not about standardization when you're working with developers. It's about easy. You make it as easy as possible because that developer has got a whole host of tasks they're doing. They need that little telecom piece that's maybe a fraction of their project, You know, maybe 4%, 2% of their project. They just need this SMS alert to work. It has to be easy that they can just cut, paste, and uh, run with it. So easy dominates. So we're seeing telcos have another go. And of course, you know they believe that um, quality of service is going to be very important because they've been making all these big 5G investments. But challenge there is, you know, I always point out, fixed broadband is 10 years ahead of mobile broadband. So fixed, they were the first to do uh, video streaming. They were the first to do video telephony. They were the first to do basically text communications. You know, they were the first to offer internet access. Mobile caught up 10 years later. And when you look at, for consumer, I'm talking only about consumer here, are there any consumer services that are using quality of service? My answer is no. So mm -hmm. fixed shows why the current focus of the mobile industry is just going to repeat what happened 10 years ago with uh, one API? Now, you know, I, I've pointed this out, I've explained it, but, you know, the industry, mm -hmm. I always find the telecom side of the industry, it's like there's a, there's a you know, these are our known truths. When you keep pointing out these known truths aren't really truths, it's like you can see people just cover their you know, ears and go, no, 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 I'm not listening. So it's, we're in a very interesting time. I think that when I look at what SignalWire has done with its AI gatekeeper, when I look at what Strollid is doing with VCOMs, programmable communications is getting more powerful, more sophisticated. It's getting more embedded across many different ecosystems. For example, we had a great discussion around Industry 4.0 and the importance of what SignalWire, Strollid are doing in enabling <clears throat> customer feedback to be brought back directly into the production line. Because if we look at, say, Tesla, their core platform is all about gathering customer feedback and using that mm. to drive production today. So uh, again, that's, you know, that is programmable communication. So I see what we're doing, it's very powerful. I see it, you know, lots of uh, aspects of it are driving forward into many different industries. So it's it's a great time to be in programmable communications. There are struggles, unfortunately, um, you know, as telcos try to reposition, try to take more share of the revenue. But I'd say the truth is you've got to focus on your customers and solving the problems that matter to them. And that for me, is why the AI gatekeeper, why VCOMs, and their integration 
into the solutions uh, uh, for their customers is just a great example of how you know the programmable communications will continue to evolve, innovate, and uh, make industries better. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a very good. I mean, the democratization needs to continue, and yes. I agree with you that that's how it happens. One direct question for you, Toto. We managed to avoid the topic so far. Yeah. How do you see AI, AI adoption in the industry? <laughs> yeah. Well, again, there's a lot of bullshit. So. The, the, oh, good. Oh, finally, someone says it. Thank uh, you, Alan. <laughs> but, <laughs> again, I come back to the resources that exist for the Signal Wire AI gateway. And there's some great web pages in there where it goes through all the issues you're going to face and recommendations of what you need to do with your prompting. So <clears throat> we're going through a learning phase. There are clear applications and it varies from industry to industry. Um, they're not, when we're talking about customer service, you know, hallucin hallucinations aren't going away. Um, you can minimize them, but stuff's gonna happen. And I think part of the challenge the industry or uh, enterprises that are using these tools is to realize, you know, it, it's like people, they're going to make mistakes. And we need to, you know, if the customer like gets an offer for a $1 round the world ticket, it's like, come on, that's nonsensical. That was, you know, that was a mistake. So, uh, you know, we're not going to honor that, but here's, you know, a, a voucher for a couple of hundred bucks to say sorry for that uh, misinformation. So I think we're going to go through that sort of shift. Um, I think privacy is a big issue. <clears throat> and again, you know, I'll just point to um, VCONs and the work of Strollard in enabling the training data to be able to understand how this model, where it's been trained on what data. Because I, as an individual, have every right to say, I don't want my data being used in the training. You know, because with the right prompting, that data can be, you know, uh, thrown out at uh, end users. So I think a lot of bullshit. There are applications. We're building the tools to make it easy to adopt. I think this, you know, from a legal standpoint, we're going to go through, you know, a few trials and tribulations. But just like using people, using these tools will become more uh, normal. And it's going to be used in lots and lots of ways but it, yeah it's not next year you know i mean well it is for particular applications it's a decade of transition that's going to happen where these tools will augment what we're already doing are we going to see mass unemployment no i mean come on you know i mm -hmm. all it's a great example is um <clears throat> oh god i can't remember the name of it now um but all those tools where you need to create a, a you know, because I do a lot of publishing, so I need to create an image because it's visual. You know, when people basically read a title, you know, if you've got an image there, they're like twice as likely to click on it. So you want engaging, nice graphics. And I can't afford to use basically uh, graphics designers all the time in creating custom images, but I can quite happily pay basically a couple of bucks to uh, get a nice image that will attract people to click on. So it, it's one of those where it's extending people's reach in terms of the resources they've got available. I look with uh, some of the companies I work with uh, on the uh, code they're able to create. Again, it's great. It, it, it works. They still need to do a little bit around the edges, but it extends the reach of your uh, engineering group in being able to do more with the time that they've got available. So it's a small incremental improvement. It's massively overhyped. Uh, some of the application areas are complete nonsensical, but that's part of the exploration. We don't know. So do it and see how it works. I think you put it, you touched on something very precisely. I feel like AI is a multiplicator of skill. Like if you know what you're doing with AI, you can do more of it. Yeah. If you don't know what you're doing, the risk of getting an hallucination or something that's not correct is too high. Exactly. There's a word of difference. I occasionally, I'll, I'll be honest, occasionally use uh, GPT for uh, programming questions in languages I'm not really an expert in. Like, I'm yeah. not a Python expert yet. So sometimes I don't know how to do something. But mm -hmm. if you explain it, 
very precisely, or even an example in another language, yes. you get the right the right code. If you exactly. just say, I need something, we'll do this, 90% of the time the code will not work. Correct. So you have exactly. to know what you're actually doing. It is uh, very, plus the other thing is, which you, you touch on, and I think we, I agree because signal wires AI was geared toward that. It's better to pick a smaller application, a type of application. We try to work sp precisely on uh, replacing IVRs with yeah. something more, uh, uh, with something more human, more yes. human-like, more easier to use. AI yes. is very good at fi figuring out what you want to do, yep. what you're trying to achieve between the various steps of that. And then the yep. actual steps are executed by normal systems. So you don't have the AI going into that database or whatever. It's telling exactly. you, okay, this person wants to do this. That's what's worked for us. And that is a, exactly. but yeah, no, no uh, jobs, no mass yeah. jobs. No, uh, and that's a very good point. Cause when I look at um, like Strollard, they do basically you know, sales for um, car dealerships and all they use is about augmenting the salespeople to be more successful, to drive more sales. Salespeople aren't getting basically fired. It's when you've got people there and you can help them do their job better because you can correlate. Because the great thing with an LLM that you use in your company, all the conversations are feeding in. So it may be a conversation that you've not, you know, you're unaware of, or several conversations that are taking place, maybe in another state. But the insight from that conversation could be directly relevant to the sale you're discussing at this moment. So it gives you a view across your organization and every conversation that it's uh, that's taking place. Absolutely, it is a. Uh, I think still it's going to be there. It's just not going to be as impactful as we think for a long time. Then exactly, maybe it's a decade. Some... Yeah, but but then it'll just be there, and it'll be safe. It'll be secure. It'll be, you know, with privacy protections built in, so you have compliance. You know, I mean, and there's going to be a whole host of lawsuits. I mean, uh, <clears throat> uh, RJ Burner made a very good point. You know, in the people that are going to make out on AI initially are going to be the lawyers. Hmm. <laughs> Why so? Well, because, you know, uh, people aren't protecting their customer data. So they're mm. training up models, using the customer data, not necessarily with permissions. And oh, you know, that you... way, I was thinking lawyer using AI. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Lawyers basically, uh, you know, like TCPA, where you basically are calling customers and it's like, well, you don't have permission to do that. <gasps> well, here's a fine, you know, and there's, they make a ton of money out of that. So uh, absolutely, I think that uh, that's where we're going to see the same thing happening. And that's why it's so important to have traceability on all the conversations that you're using and anonymization so you can remove uh, sort of uh, customer uh, identifiable uh, information. And it's not just names and credit card numbers or telephones. I mean, it can be like, you know, well, my favorite color is red. Okay, now you know basically if you ask, you know, as a challenge, you know, your favorite color, you put in uh, red. So that is customer identifiable data as well. So there's, it's, it's a lot more subtle than just the uh, basic stuff because, you know, we're listening to all the conversations and all those conversations can be correlated and then, uh, you know, can provide stuff that, you know, could basically enable, you know, accounts to be hacked. Yeah, it is. That, that portion is really good. Still growing, I think the whole exactly. ethics discussion around AI is still a work in progress, and that's where open source will again be important because Correct. that's the so far in any industry, the software industry, accountability came from open source, like cryptography yes. truly took off when you could use uh, PGP and GPG first. Oh the yeah, first, and then could, there's, uh, yeah. there's going to be a lot. Well, well chat GPT, uh, and let's face it, they showed it's like. You know, they asked, I can't remember the name of the actress, you know, can we use your voice? And she said, no. And they tried again. And she said, no. And they went, oh, sod it. We're going to use your voice anyway. That shows mm -hmm. the type of company, the type of people they are. And you can go, well, you know, ChatGPT is the answer. And it's like, well, no. Open source is the answer. Because open source is accountable. 
because if you do stuff like that as an open source project, you're dead in the water, full stop. The community moves away because you've done something that basically breaks social norms. Well, ChatGPT, hey, look at the billions we've got flowing. Give us some more billions. <laughs> you know, they're immune yeah. to basically uh, such social norms. So uh, what can people expect at TADAC Global in October? Yep. So uh, we're gathering sponsors. Uh, of course, we have lots more room for more sponsors. Uh, at the moment, we've got um, Strollid will be there. So they'll be focusing on VCon, which is a great skill. So for example, one of, um, so Suraj, he was one of the hackers. Um, he got a um, summer intern project. So he's just, you know, a, a, a student down in Florida. And because of the skills he built up, on using VCon, he was able to get a summer intern project enabling uh, VCons for the open source project Jambones. And that's just beautiful. You've got basically, nice. uh, you know, uh, uh, Tadhack helping some of the, uh, you know, developers not only, you know, win prize money for the hacks, but also get summer jobs that give them amazing, relevant experience. So we're hoping to do a lot more of that. We've got a new uh, sponsor on board, TSG Global. They're a CPAS, so you know, they've been doing a lot of work in the CPAS space, but they've got some very interesting tech around identity and privacy protection. So again, they want to show the tools and just throw it out there and let developers play. Because that's Tadak Global. You know, we've got hacks all around the world. So South America, North America, Europe, Asia, Africa. And everybody's in a different situation, a different environment. And what we ask people to do is, well, here are the technologies. Use these to solve problems that matter to you in your home, work, or community life. And from that, you get to see the diversity of uh, problems people face and some really innovative solutions that help people launch companies, that help people get great positions in companies, and you know, also, you know, bring people together to, so for example, with in Sri Lanka, we had a great hack. Um, it was about monitoring uh, stream river flow, uh, well, stream flow, you know, because in farms, you've got lots of sort of streams you're having to bring around to uh, irrigate irrigation. That's the word I was looking for. Uh, so you could monitor the irrigation and react to changes in that and that massive drastically improved the efficiency of water and a team got together created the solution deployed the solution and you know became a real business because the key is it's priced appropriately you know they're taking mm -hmm. tech they're building it locally the you know people costs are local people costs so it enables you to deliver a solution that works in Sri Lanka. We've had the same model in Colombia, uh, same model in, for example, Nigeria, where they build a solution in for Nigeria, it was air quality monitoring. Again, very simple hack that enabled from a community level, you know, people to monitor the air quality in or around their homes. So uh, it's empowering democratization and enabling people locally to produce solutions that work in their country. That is super duper interesting. Yeah, uh, as an aside, I think Africa in particular is going to be a very big market in the future. And Absolutely. There's yes, a lot of talented people. people. There's yeah. a lot of talented people growing up using open source tools, learning how to use them. And it's the next India. Like I've yes. seen, I've, it's the same story. India started out from people learning open source tools because they were free. Once you had an internet connection, you could do whatever. And now I see the same thing happening with some areas in Africa. So that's going yes. to be very, very interesting. And, oh, yeah, um, absolutely. And, and it's great to have that happen. Well, Alan, I mean, uh, thank you for all the work you do. Thank you for TADAC. Thank you for all the TED summits <laughs> I've been to and the fun I've had there. And looking forward to the next one. Absolutely. And, uh, thank, thank you so much. You have any uh, click on weekly? Do you have anything else on the calendar other than a tag tad hack in October yet? Or oh yeah, we've got Tad or... Summit, and so Tad Hack will be on the Saturday, Sunday. So that's the nineteenth, twentieth, and mm -hmm. then on the twenty second, twenty third, we're going to have a Tad Summit in uh, New York City. So we haven't got the location sorted out at the moment. Uh, again, we're building up sponsors. We're putting a great agenda together. 
And I really wanted to make sure that we had the TED Summit after the TED Hack so we could review all the great innovations created. And for this year, for uh, TED Summit, we're going to be a little bit more controversial. Uh, we've been stirring oh, cool. things up. You know, we're the conscience for the industry. We're, um, I think we're entering a very interesting time where there's a lot of pressure that's being applied to programmable communications from the outside. And I think, you know, there's an important role for somebody that can speak the truth, that can basically you know, be the conscience for the overall industry to help everyone succeed. Because what we're talking about, you know, programmable telecoms is just enabling people and things to work together more efficiently using the best tools that are out there. We've discussed AI, we've discussed VCOM, and it's just enabling that to be delivered in a way that's cost effective for all around the world. So, you know, my view is programmable, you know, communications is here to stay for, you know, the rest of basically this century. And it's really just helping the innovators, you know, get through this current bump in the industry where, shall we say, um, you know, things are maybe a little tougher than they need to be because people are trying to sit on their monopolies and those monopolies are not going to last. Yeah, indeed. That's, that's a good, that's a good thing. The uh, people have been, well, that's the other thing open source does. We force yes. people to move. So yeah. the industry has to do something. You got to come for the lunch. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, Ellen, thank you for joining us today. It was a pleasure having you. And it was Absolutely. a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Have a great weekend.